News of the day. Mr. Zimmerman, have you made a decision as to whether or not you want to testify in this case? With values that never die. There are certainly a lot of controversies or scandals brewing right now when it comes to the Obama administration. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Dealing with the federal government is not always high tech and it's not always user friendly. The stories that matter. This is a massive escalation in the tension here in Egypt. The issues that count. I don't know why the media tries to make this into a sensation. We have never hidden the fact that we supply Syria with weapons. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. He's got the red, white, blue, flying high on a farm. Welcome to American Heartland. I am your host, Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Thanks for being with us. We have a jam-packed show, including a discussion with Fred Peterson on the border crisis. He has a brilliant solution. We have a brilliant author, Charles Sutherland, who will join us to discuss the impact of genetically modified food. We're also going to discuss the problems that Hollywood is having, once again, getting moviegoers to go to the movies during the summer. But before we get to all of that, we're going to begin this broadcast today with Obama's foreign policy. What a mess it is. You know, it seems that every time I title one of these shows when they're posted on YouTube, the word chaos is being used all the time. We have chaos on our borders. And what do we have abroad? Chaos. There are more hot spots today. There are more places simmering than we have seen since the late 1970s. The world is more unstable now than it has been in decades. And think about the irony of that. This president was elected to be a peacemaker, to bring tranquility, in the words of the White House press secretary, to bring tranquility around the world, to forge great bonds with our allies. Instead, what is the reality of this president's withdrawal of American power around the world. What is that reality? The reality is that almost everywhere you look, there is chaos. Russia has taken over Crimea. Russia has rebels in eastern Ukraine. Russia has given weapons to these rebels that have resulted in the recent downing of a commercial airline. In other parts of the world, Japan and Taiwan, our allies, fear that China may make incursions on their territory and America may not stand by their commitments. In Syria, there is a civil war that the president has done very little about to the point that it spilled over into the borders of Iraq and there, because he withdrew American forces against the council of his military, ISIS has run roughshod all over Iraq, including the persecution of Christians there. There are now reports that ISIS is telling Christians to basically get out, convert or get out. They're told that they have to leave their villages, all their possessions behind. They have 72 hours to go. Otherwise, they will be fined or executed. So ISIS is running rampant across the Middle East and threatens Baghdad. So much so that the president who wanted one of his crowning foreign policy achievements to be to pull us out of Iraq is actually forced to send more troops in. We now have almost a thousand troops back there, back in Iraq. So Iraq is a trouble spot. And what else? Iran. He thinks this president and his secretary of state, John Kerry, that he's going to be able to negotiate with Iran. And what we see when you negotiate with terrorists, it doesn't work. Look at what the Israelis are contending with. They've tried to appease the Palestinians in Gaza. And now what? They are forced to invade. And so you actually have another conflagration in the Middle East with Israeli forces trying to knock out 
the infrastructure that Hamas has created that threatens Israelis on a daily basis. And the nincompoop Obama and his Secretary of State think that they are going to be able to talk Iran out of producing a nuclear bomb when it is very clear that all that they are doing is stalling. Now, you remember... When the president began these negotiations, he set a deadline, a firm deadline, and he reassured the public that some of the sanctions would be released. The Iranians would get a respite from the sanctions regime, which has been very effective, and that if the negotiations weren't concluded effectively, well, then the sanctions would be reimposed. Yet... One crucial fact was overlooked. The word deadline for Mr. Obama doesn't mean a thing. Because guess what? There is no agreement. And the latest word now is that the deadline has been expanded. There are four more months, four more months of negotiating so that Iran can continue to talk on the one hand, while the centrifuges keep on spinning. Recently, John Kerry tried to defend his Iranian policy on Fox News, and he came across as short-tempered and prickly, certainly not like the statesman he wants people to believe that he is, certainly not like the man pursuing the Nobel Peace Prize that obviously he was trying to present himself as in the in the first few um, years of this term. Well, you know what? He came across as a lizard. I've said that many times about him. I consider him a lizard. If you notice every second or third word, he licks his lips and he seems like an individual that is just as incompetent, just as slippery, just as sly as the commander in chief whom he serves. Listen to his interaction with Chris Wallace as he tries to defend the indefensible. Uh, Actually, Chris, uh, they're reducing their enrichment, and uh, the fact is that this is the first time in 10 years under this current deal that Iran's nuclear program is being rolled back. And I know you and others don't ever want to give the Obama administration credit for almost anything, but the fact is this is the first administration to get a rollback in those 10 years, and right now Israel and countries in the region and the world are safer because Iran's 20% enriched uranium is now being reduced to zero. And under this agreement to continue the negotiations for four months, Iran will further reduce the capacity of that enriched uranium to be used by turning it into fuel for the research reactor, which makes it almost impossible to be used in a weapon. In addition, we have inspectors in their facilities every single day in addition to that, they have not been able to move forward on the Iraq plutonium heavy water reactor. Well, sir, they can continue. In, in, no, 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 I, I, Chris, you like to ask questions, enrichment. but you don't like to get answers. I, I, no, I answer. do, sir, but they do. Let they are answer. able to continue enrichment. They are answer. able to continue work on their centrifuge. Chris, I don't care how many questions you ask. I'm going to finish my answer. And I am telling you that everybody said at the beginning of this, the sanctions won't work. The, uh, the uh, uh, sanctions regime won't hold. Iran won't do what it's supposed to, and they're dead wrong. Everything that Iran was supposed to do, they have done with respect to this. You know, he's essentially trying to bully Chris Wallace out of asking a follow-up question. You know, it's, 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 it must be news to the Secretary of State that the press is allowed to interject in the middle of an answer when there is a contradictory fact, when another point should be made or can be made. That is the role of the press, to ask tough questions. Instead, he's acting like a spoiled little brat trying to browbeat Chris Wallace into silence. And regarding being able to finish his points, Chris Wallace had to aptly remind him that it was he and his team that put restraints on how much time was given to the segment. Roll it. And we believe, and the sanctions have held... And we believe that it is smart to continue the negotiation as Israel even and others said. Don't rush to an agreement. A bad deal is worse than no deal. 
and we agree. And so we're trying to move, but we are making some progress, Chris, and we're not going to turn our back on that progress. We're going to try to continue for the next four months. And I think what we're doing by holding their, their, uh, their, their nuclear program at a lower level, we've expanded the breakout time. The world is safer, and this is a smart deal. Finally, sir, and, and I wanted to give you an opportunity to answer the question there. Finally, I'm, yeah. It's, it, listen, it, it, the limits on time have been put on by your people. We'd talk to you all day, sir. Yeah, in fact, he's been avoiding Fox News for months. So uh, his uh, testiness with Chris Wallace was way, way, way out of line. But you know why he's testy? Because it's not a smart deal. They reassured us that when they were pulling out of Iraq, everything would be okay. And instead, we have chaos there. Now they're reassuring us that Iran, the situation with Iran, is under control. We know what the likely scenario, the ultimate likely scenario will be. Ultimately, Israel is going to have to take matters into its own hands. And following a bombing campaign in Gaza, you bet your bottom dollar, they're the ones that are going to truly settle the Iranian question by bombing the centrifuges out of existence. That's the only language that the Iranians will ultimately understand. And shame on the president and the secretary of state for being treated like fools by the Iranians in these negotiations. You know, speaking of chaos... There's even more chaos with this administration. A district course court has ruled regarding Obamacare, which is in shambles already with so many of its provisions being delayed. A court ruled this week that the subsidies that were supposed to be given may not be constitutional. Now, the administration has said that they're going to appeal this decision, and ultimately it's going to go to the Supreme Court. But in a nutshell, the Affordable Care Act states very clearly that subsidies to individuals who purchase health care can only be given by the states. Yet many states refuse to set up exchanges, and therefore the federal government stepped in and is providing subsidies for individuals who qualify. But this ruling by the, uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia states very clearly, no, no, no. The law says there in black and white that the subsidies can only be given by the states. And yet the White House is arguing that there is an intent to the law, which supersedes, guess what, the letter of the law. Check out this exchange between Jonathan Carl of ABC News and the White House Press Secretary. Josh, uh, back to the uh, uh, D.C. Circuit Court opinion. Um, it, I understand you, you believe you'll win on appeal, um, but if this opinion is upheld, does it effectively gut Obamacare by eliminating up to 5 million subsidies? Uh, uh, well, John, as you point out, there are millions of Americans across the country who do benefit in a very important way from the Affordable Care Act. Uh, millions of Americans are eligible for tax credits that make their health insurance more affordable for them. That is one of the hallmark achievements of the Affordable Care Act, uh, and it is clear that the intent of Congress was to make sure that every eligible American had access to those tax credits, whether or not uh, their marketplace was operated by federal officials or by local state officials. So we feel very confident in the legal case that we'll make before the court, uh, and the Department of Justice will be responsible for pressing that argument, uh, and we feel confident in the argument they'll be making. Okay, but that didn't answer my question. I said if this decision is upheld and you were just slapped down by a circuit court, if this decision is upheld, does it effectively gut Obamacare? It means, for instance, that you can, the president can no longer say that people can have access to health care for the price of a cell phone bill. I mean, this is going to this would wipe away 4.7 million right now, 4.7 million uh, people's subsidies. Well, I, you and I agree with the fact that there are uh, millions of Americans that currently benefit from this provision of the law, uh, and we are confident that that law uh, 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 has the kind of legal basis to withstand legal scrutiny. If it is upheld, does it go to Obamacare? It's a simple question. Well, I know. It's a hypothetical question, though, and one I'm not in a position to entertain. We feel confident in our legal case. We've already won two cases at the uh, district court level. Um, you know, we're going to the – the, uh, the, the Justice Department will be pressing this case uh, before the entire D.C. Circuit, uh, and we feel confident about the case that they'll be making. The law very clearly stable 
to those who enroll through state exchange. I don't have uh, the fancy legal degree that I referred to earlier, but I do think that what, what the, the courts are charged with doing is evaluating the intent of Congress. Uh, and the intent of Congress in this case, I think, is uh, not just clear, it's transparent. Uh, Congress intended for every eligible American to have access to these tax credits that lower their health care costs, whether or not the marketplace was run by federal officials or state. Now, if Congress intended that, why does the letter of the law say otherwise? And the key question that the Supreme Court is going to have to answer is, can we read or not read? That is the question. You're listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. And we're upholding values that are never going to die. Stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Welcome back to American Heartland with Dr. Grace. I am the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. You're actually listening to Toby Keith's Stays in Mexico. Unfortunately, nowadays, nothing seems to stay in Mexico. We have a border crisis, chaos on the southern border. Tens of thousands of minors, often unaccompanied, are flooding this United States. And the president is doing what? He is simply saying, let's catch them and let's redistribute them across the land. All across the nation, there are protests. The American people are rising up against this. An unsecure border is a threat to our security. We have gangs coming in. We have the possibility of terrorists coming in. We have the possibility of all kinds of diseases penetrating our communities. And more so, it is a drain on our social services. This is a crisis, and it is ongoing, and the president once again appears to be hapless. He doesn't seem to know what to do. Now there is a cry for solutions, and there are a few people, brilliant people, saying, well, if you're going to solve the problem, you need first to understand what is the root cause, and the root cause is the president granting amnesty to those who are under the age of 18. This is the magnet that has precipitated this crisis. And if we're going to fix the problem, we need to address both the magnet and the current situation of what the hell we do with the folks that are here. So listen to Ted Cruz trying to give us a solution. Roll you it, want to block President Obama from taking more executive actions to allow some of the illegals already in this country to stay here. You want to do that before moving to deal with the new crisis of kids coming from Central America. Why? Well, what I want to do is solve the crisis. Uh, I agree with the president in one respect. We are seeing a humanitarian crisis. We are seeing tens of thousands of young children coming in illegally, being brutalized, being mistreated by global transnational drug cartels. And the cause of this crisis is the promise of amnesty. If you look at the history of of, of this issue, in 2011 there were roughly 6,000 children apprehended coming in illegally. Then, in 2012, President Obama unilaterally granted amnesty to some 800,000 people who were here illegally, who entered as children. The direct foreseeable consequence of that was the number of unaccompanied children skyrocketed so that this year, the Obama administration's estimating 90,000 kids will come next year, 145,000. That's up from just 6,000 three years ago. 
So the senator is proposing we've got to get to the bottom of the problem by immediately revoking this promise of amnesty for minors. And he is proposing legislation to do that. And apart from trying to uh, get to the root cause of the problem, we also have to ask ourselves, well, what do we do with the folks that are already here? And this week, I was really impressed by documents that came my way by a very good friend of mine. He is Fred Peterson. He's a decorated combat veteran and a former Marine Corps lieutenant colonel. He has served in the Joint Task Force 6 for Counter Drug based in Fort Bliss, Texas. He's also organized and performed five official border security missions, both north and south, resulting in formal congressional border security reports. In other words, Mr. Peterson is an expert on our border, and he has a simple, brilliant solution on the question that is vexing us all. What do we do with these unaccompanied minors? Welcome to the show, Fred. Uh, You have a brilliant solution to what we do with these unaccompanied minors. Can you tell the audience of American Heartland what you propose? (laughs) Well, uh, I think I look at it as being um, kind of a common sense solution that uh, meets our humanitarian instincts, our high aspirations, and uh, our morality as a, as a good people, as well as uh, our instincts of self-preservation and rational uh, conduct in, in this matter. I think we should say in preference, uh, preference uh, and uh, preface to this that what is happening on the border is not an accident and it is not new. What is new is the vast numbers and the, the step up that has been going on uh, for the last oh, 10 years and more. In fact, ever since the immigration bill was rewritten in the late 60s, there has been a, a tremendous influx uh, across the border. But in the last several months, just beginning with this year, uh, there has been a tremendous increase, as we all know, and are very perplexed. And everyone seems uh, intimidated by the uh, vast numbers coming across, by the unprecedented nature of this assault on our sovereignty and on our borders. And the question is, what do we do about it? And everyone stands around with their hands in their pockets and say, well, we should secure the border. We should do this and that. But we need to find out what to do with the people that have come across the border. And I've come up with what I think is almost an embarrassingly simple solution to that, and that is the return of lost property. You're quite right. uh, I was amazed. It is such a simple solution. Uh, Fred suggests (laughs) that we simply round up these folks and deliver them to their respective embassies, the embassies of the countries that they come from. So we bring them there, and then we tell the embassy that it is their problem. They must house these folks. They must feed them. They must clothe them. They must bring them back to their home country. It's as simple as that. Well, it is, in fact. And uh, not one of these countries has been identified as... uh, as a rogue state or as a, uh, a, a tremendous uh, uh, a human rights violator or an outcast from the United Nations or the OAS. Uh, we're, we're speaking of the uh, large contributors, uh, the Southern uh, Americas, that are sending them here. And yet we're at a position now where we don't even know who is coming across the border. The border security is so weak that we have people coming across from all over. And the simple solution to this is not to spend vast amounts of American money, which we, quite frankly, we don't have right now. We simply don't have right now. The simple solution is to return lost property to the embassy, which is the sovereign territory or the consulates, the sovereign territory 
of the nation which it represents. That is so, and that simply is, in good faith right. return them to their country. Yes, and that <clears throat> is also a humanitarian solution because it is then the responsibility of that country to unite these children back with their families. Now, Fred, let me ask you this. What do you say to critics of this proposal who would argue, well, look, Fred, the numbers are so huge. These embassies don't have the uh, accommodations for them so that, that your plan is probably, it may be physically impracticable. What do you argue? What is your counter argument to that? Well, uh, the counter argument, uh, it's not, I really haven't had that critique thrown against it. Usually I get wide eyed uh, stare of uh, uh, embarrassment at the simplicity of this. The, the answer to that is simply we work with the embassy. It, it, it's actually their problem. They should be very grateful to receive their people back and have an opportunity to reunite them with their parents and I'm sure their loving families. If they need some assistance in helping to expedite the exit so that they can continue to process new waves, we will certainly uh, make accommodations available and work with these countries in a humanitarian manner to exit these people back, to rejoin them with their families and, uh, uh, but the problem is not ours, it is theirs. Yeah, that we're is very well said. Property, and we're assisting them in very good faith and in a very humanitarian manner to return them to their countries here. Right. And, and if the embassies in some way, Grace, did not wish to cooperate or find this, and we let's not be naive here, many of them have an economic interest in taking the very lowest class of the low many which are uh, not even, not, not fluent, utterly illiterate, and do not even speak Spanish. They speak other patois of native uh, amalgam tongues. Uh, these are the lowest of the low among them, and they think that what they're doing is exporting them here, and the problem is complicated because when they get their EBT cards and their other uh, social benefits and all here, money is then taken from the American taxpayer and sent back to the country. That's right. So it's, it's, exactly. Item. It's a losing enterprise sure. for us and a winning enterprise for them. What do you do Precisely. to those embassies who say, well, we're not going to cooperate in this plan of yours? What kind of punitive measures would you enact upon those embassies who say well, no? Grace, we have to recognize that Behavior rewarded is behavior replicated and increased. Behavior, we should say, disincentivized, let's use that as a euphemism, is a behavior that is reduced. We need to find ways to disincentivize the behavior of these exporting countries, exporting, how, how crass, to export their own people. But we need a way to disincentivize, and if uh, many of these countries are recipients of uh, United States uh, largesse in aid, in foreign aid, uh, and the cost of repatriation and reuniting the humanity with their their um, their progeny can be can be paid for by the country that has lost the children, indeed, not by indeed. the country that upon which the children have been dumped and it's not just children this is this is something that is a, a propaganda device to have us all believe it's all about the children it, it really isn't take a look at the the video take a look at the pictures coming out of there take a look at the few brave uh, investigative reporters that have gone down to the border you are right. You are right, sure. Fred. And your solution is right on. It is simple. It is effective. It is brilliant. We thank you for that. And we hope that your solution falls upon the ears of congressmen and that they listen carefully to the wise counsel of Fred Peterson. Thank you so much for being on the show with thank us so today, much. and we will be sure to call upon our border expert in the future. You're listening to Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com, upholding well, values there, that never, ever die. Ain't a damn one know how to do the Dougie.
This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. This is American Heartland, and I'm your host, Dr. Grace, the editor of Politics and Culture at WorldTribune.com. Do you have a love-hate relationship with food? Well, let me tell you, I certainly do, and I think food, which used to be a great joy, is becoming so darn complicated. Recently, I found myself washing a bowl of strawberries and blueberries, and as the water is dripping across this delicious fruit, was I thinking, oh, this is going to be so much fun to eat, this is going to be a great break, this is so nutritious for my children? Do you know what I was thinking as I was washing blueberries and strawberries? Great source of antioxidants. Have you noticed that we think about food so often in terms of its scientific content. If you look at chicken, you'll say a great source of protein. If you look at bread, you'll say, hmm, better watch those carbs. Food used to be so much simpler. Here today to discuss just how complicated food has become is a really good friend of mine, a brilliant man. He's been an international businessman for over 30 years. He was also the director of development of the Washington Times. He's the author of several books, including Clash of the Gods, The Poison Planters, and most recently, a book that has a lot of head spinning. It's called GMO Food Poison Handbook. Here is Mr. Charles Sutherland. Hi, Charles. How are you? Fine. Thank you very much. How are you? I'm well. It's great to have you. And uh, your book, The GMO Food Poison Handbook, has so many interesting components. It is based on a ton of research, and it is telling us that essentially so much of our food contains poisons. Can you explain that? Uh, exactly. Well, GMO stands for genetically modified organisms. And what they are is, is usually when you crossbreed a plant, you crossbreed peas or corn, you use the actual uh, uh, food product itself, the crop to crossbreed. GMOs, you insert something into the crop which is not part of nature. In this case, for example, it, it's two different kinds of poison. So the way, the way this started is uh, Monsanto started to make a ton of money selling Roundup, which is a herbicide. But they realized that the herbicide to whom they sold to farmers, the herbicide also kills the crops. So they had to develop some kind of approach to be able to sell their Roundup herbicides and not kill the crops. So what they did is they created crops which can absorb glyphosate, the poison in, herbic- in, in Roundup. It can absorb the glyphosate and not die. And then to add to the issue, they inserted DNA into these same crops called BT, it's uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, which is a soil bacteria. And the purpose of the soil bacteria is that when it's put into a seed of a crop, any time a pest or other bug bites the seed of the crop, that pest dies. So as a consequence, GMO crops are designed to be poisonous and to absorb poison. And they are responsible for probably about 75% of all the food we eat. But 85% of the corn, the GMO corn, about 95% of sugar beets and soybeans, it's all GMO stuff. Now, you mentioned this company, Monsanto. Can you tell us about this firm? Well, Monsanto started many, many decades ago in the Midwest. And it created PCBs, which are, you know, the, the chemicals that go in the lubricants and so forth and, and refrigeration. Then it created Agent Orange, and then it created a whole host of different chemical products. So it, it's, na- it's known for producing chemicals and poisonous chemicals. But it got into the food business because they, they needed another market in order to, to expand, so they got into the food market. And what, once they developed the herbicide Roundup, which became the best herbicide in history, uh, they were making a, t- a lot of money, but that, that became to be an issue because they were killing the crops and flowers with the herbicide Roundup. So they had to develop some approach to keep selling Roundup 
and they so they developed the GMO crops, which not only helped them continue to sell Roundup, but became a product in itself. Right. So you're saying somewhere between the range of 75 to 85 percent of our food contains these GMOs, which are actually poisonous to us. What are the effects yeah. of the GMOs on our bodies? Well, there are a number of effects. One of the most obvious is that when you insert a DNA into a crop, into a seed, you, what they do is they, they, cover, they cover a piece of gold or a piece of tungsten with this DNA poison, and they shove it into the seed, they blast it into the seed. Anytime you insert something into a seed, you obviously are knocking something out of the seed, and you're also obviously disturbing the internal dynamics of the seed. Because everything in nature is programmed for its own survival. So anytime you insert a foreign object into something in nature, number one, it, it readjusts itself to, to account for it. Number two, it begins to develop its own toxins in order to, to get rid of the foreign object that's coming into itself. So what happens is, is these, these seeds have now, although they represent obviously millions of years of evolution, the seeds have now been disturbed in terms of both containing poison and removing certain things from it. As a consequence, what happens is these seeds are not as nutritious as ordinary seeds because a lot of the nutrition has been knocked out. So what happens when you eat a seed, when you eat a crop that's not nutritious, the body wants more. As a consequence, you eat more and more of these things, which means you become obese, which leads to diabetes. Right, right. Now, tell us, Charles, is this an international problem, or is this rooted particularly in the United States? It's an international problem, because actually 62 countries around the world have banned GMO crops, but the United States won't ban them, largely because they're largely supported uh, by President Obama and, and different people in Congress. I, I joke that, that one of the few bipartisan issues of cooperation in the U.S. are GMO crops because there's corruption on every place. But the biggest su- supporter of GMO crops is uh, Barack Obama, who actually created a new position at the, federal, at the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and he appointed to that new position for food safety as the senior vice president of Monsanto, who was particular, who was uniformly and, and singularly responsible for promoting these crops for the last 15 or 20 years, and so and, and once he, once he did that, he had the support of the FDA because it's his own man there, and Monsanto has the support of the FDA because it's their own man. And Michael Taylor has has been with the Department of Agriculture, then he went to Monsanto, then back to the FDA, then back to Monsanto, now he's back at the FDA. Right, so, it, a, right. so Monsanto essentially has, uh, basically provides funds for both Democrats and Republicans, is that why they oh, have yes. such a stranglehold? Absolutely right. And uh, and also also the, the uh, Bill Gates, who and has purchased about half a million shares of Monsanto, and Warren Buffett as well, as a consequence, what they do they, they partnered with President Obama, and they have a project in Africa, which is funded largely by the USAID, so it's taxpayer money, to sell these seeds to the people in southern Africa. So, so the, the whole thing is one massive uh, corruption. Right. Now, you say that there's a tug of war between Obama, who is actually protecting Monsanto, as uh, supporting this genetically modified food, and his base. His base disagrees with him on this, correct? Oh, yes. I mean, it. It's shocking because his base is surprised to learn that uh, he is very un- environmental because not only do these crops poison the food, but, but when you have all these pesticides and toxins going into the crops, they're obviously going into the soil and into the air. And, and, and it's something that, somebody, that people also do not know is that ethanol itself, which is produced largely by corn, right? And this is all GMO corn. It's corn which has all these chemicals in it. And so when you make a fuel for automobiles called ethanol, you are putting into the air these toxins which are not so easily dissipated as uh, gasoline. Gasoline is a petrol fuel, so it's part of nature. As a consequence of all this, the ethanol, and there are studies from Stanford, Stanford University about this, ethanol is more toxic than gasoline. And so the environmental base of, of President Obama are, are furious with him because he is polluting more than more than anybody else has been polluting. Right. I mean, so and, and Charles, in the countries where uh, this genetically modified food has been banned, how did they succeed in that? And what do you think is the way forward here in the United States so we can ensure that the food that we are feeding our families is healthy and nutritious? 
But the first thing they did is they passed what they call labeling laws. So you have to label what's in the food. Now, Monsanto has been fighting, has a huge legal department, and they've been fighting labeling laws for two decades so that anything which, which is produced by Monsanto, when it becomes a food product, they do not have to label that there are toxins inside of this. So most of these countries have passed labeling laws, and then once the labeling laws are, are passed, people see what's inside of the food because they can read the label on the food package. Then they start, people, the public gets upset and they start banning GMO crops altogether. I see. Now, I see. In, mm-hmm. in, in the U.S., that has not happened because Monsanto, uh, Vermont a few months ago passed a serious labeling law, and two weeks later Monsanto sued the state of Vermont to prevent it from implementing the law. And, they're, and Oregon right now is planning to pass a law in November in Monsanto and different people, different supporters of Monsanto are already spending millions of dollars to prevent that law from being passed, the labeling law. Right. Well, this is absolutely fascinating because uh, the First Lady, Michelle Obama, is on a crusade to reduce obesity here in the United States. And when we look at the facts, it is her own husband who supports Monsanto and this genetically modified food, because it doesn't have the nutritious the, the nutrients that we crave, leads us to eat more and more. So the problem is, right next to her, it's her husband. If she wants to help reduce obesity, one of the things to do is to, um, you know, uh, fight back against Monsanto, as you say, label our food correctly and ban genetically modified food. Now, Charles, let me ask you this. To the man and woman right now who is listening to this and just wants to provide a healthy meal uh, to their children, to their families, do you suggest that they simply buy organic? Is that the solution, the immediate solution? Yes, organic is the immediate solution because even when people, when the stores say something is natural, that doesn't mean anything because uh, they, that, that word natural has been contaminated. So organic is the, it was the only safe food to buy. And the interesting thing is that people, when they, have to make, when they declare their food organic, they have to pass through certain tests uh, to label it organic. Unlike Monsanto, who, who creates poison, does not have to label any of its food products. That's, that's, that's a bizarre thing, but organic is, is a healthy way to, to do it, absolutely. Right, and so uh, why is it that organic food, which is basically food that is not tampered with, it's just you know natural, to use now a word that's complicated, uh, why is that so much more expensive than this genetically modified uh, poison that we are actually eating? Well, sometimes, some places it is, some places it's not. It really, it's largely a function of so many people are are not buying organic food, so, so far, that, that many farmers are not producing it because they can't sell it because people are buying the GMO crops. So it becomes a function of the market. One of the campaigns for the, G, for the organic food suppliers is stop buying GMO food and start buying organic food so we can, we can plant more of it and sell more of it. So it's largely a function of the marketplace. Awesome. What can the audience find in your book, The GMO Food Poison Handbook? Well, they can find this. First of all, they can see the book uh, summarizes studies in 30 different countries about different GMO poisoning. And then there's links to it, the actual research itself, so people can go to see the actual research studies if they want to do that. But, but the, uh, it, it shows how, how it affects different things, how it affects diabetes, how it affects the brain, how it affects the intestines. For example, once you have these GMO uh, DNA in your system, they automatically grow by themselves inside of your intestine. So, so, so it shows how it affects different parts of the body, how it creates you know, issues for, for the kidney, for breast, to create breast cancer and, and things like and testicular cancer. It, it breaks it down uh, by, by medical malady as to how these things are affecting each part of the body. And it shows the research studies from scientists and biologists and medical doctors in 30 countries which document these particular facts. Absolutely fascinating, Charles. Thank you for producing such an important, awesome book. It is called The GMO Food Poison Handbook. It is available at barnesandnoble.com. It is available on amazon.com. I encourage everybody out there to buy it. Buy Charles Sutherland's GMO Food Poison Handbook. You won't regret it. This is vital information for your family. As for me, I'm relieved. I'm relieved that my recent weight gain is now clear to me. It has nothing to do with me indulging a little bit more. It's these (laughs) genetically modified foods. And I'm going to go organic from now on. Charles, thank you so much for being with us and for producing such valuable information for the public.
Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure. You are listening to Dr. Grace, who's going to go home and cook an organic meal. And you know what? When I look at it, I'm just going to say, delicious. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. The stories that matter, the issues that count. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace. Doing what she likes. She likes hearing how good she looks in them blue jeans. Little kisses, sweeter than sweet tea. Things are whispering. Welcome back. This is a beautiful summer in Massachusetts, where I currently reside, and I'm doing all the things that I really like, including rolling down the highway with music blaring, I'm going to the beach, I'm going out for dinner, I'm playing with my children, I'm vacationing abroad. I am doing lots of fun things, but guess what I'm not doing this summer? Apparently, it's what many folks are not doing this summer, and that is going to the movies. The movies are facing another catastrophic season. Hollywood is facing the worst summer in eight years, and that is a headline from The Hollywood Reporter. Once again, just like last summer, last summer we did a whole segment on dreadful movies. It doesn't seem that Hollywood learned anything from it. The box office was very low last summer. And on American Heartland, we compared the crop of dreadful movies that Hollywood is producing today. And we contrasted those with the great movies of several decades ago. And it doesn't seem that Hollywood has learned a thing from the dismal showing last year, it appears that this summer there is an even greater deficit. So in a nutshell, folks are not going to the movies. And why is that? Is it because they don't want to go to the movies? Well, let's take me as an example and my husband. We love the movies. I've said that many times on this show. And very often on the weekends, we're going to go to movie phone and we'll ask each other, I'll ask him, hey, Jeff, what's playing out there? Is there anything we want to see? And weekend after weekend after weekend, we'll scroll down and go, what about this? Nah, it's too violent. What about this one? Ugh, politically correct. What about this one? Ugh, boring and predictable. What about this comedy? I've seen another one by that director and it was really profane. What about this movie? Too violent. What about this? Oh, a a cheap rendition of a former classic. In other words, we want to give Hollywood our money. We want to go to the movies and we're disappointed that there's nothing out there that we care to see. So one weekend... We had the babysitter and we said, you know what? Let's just go out there. Let's just suspend our critical eye. Let's just choose something and try to have fun. And so we opened our pocketbook and we paid the fare. We went to see A Million million Ways to Die. It stars uh, Charlene Theron and Seth MacFarlane. And we were horrified. Well, we should have known better. Listen to a small sample of the trailer. And I want to warn you that it is a little bit graphic. That's just the trailer. And we also had to uh, delete some foul language. Oh, my God. I just broke up with her. Quick, just pretend you're my girlfriend. I'm his girlfriend. A lot of sexual activity. All the time. It's, I, I live inside her. So if you want to send me a letter, you got to address it care of her vagina. Yep. Aim up. Get ready. I'm about to shoot a full load at your can. <laughs> now, that's the trailer of A Million Ways to Die in the West. We saw this movie, and it was written by Seth MacFarlane, who is actually quite a funny guy. I literally walked out of there turning to my husband and I said to him, it is obvious that this guy's a porn addict because the language was filthy and it is the language that comes out of pornography. It's not funny. And you know what? 
some critics are saying the problem with Hollywood nowadays is that they can't even market the movies to the audience because usually you go see a movie based on a trailer that you've seen at the movies. So it's a vicious, a vicious circle. My husband and I have not been in the, I haven't, we haven't been there together to see a movie since we saw that film. We were horrified by that film. We thought there was maybe just one or two funny moments. And for the most part, it was a movie that was graphic. It was graphic in its language. It didn't have to be graphic visually. It was really disgusting. It turned our stomach. And we figure, you know what? We've got better ways to spend our time and better ways to spend our money. And so someone like my husband and I, well, we're not seeing the trailers of upcoming movies because we're not going to the movies. And that's the vicious cycle that Hollywood has created. Now, we've got to ask this question. What is Hollywood producing? What are they constantly producing? They are doing two things. They are reveling in the ugly. We're producing a culture of ugliness. So much of what you see is plainly ugly. Over the weekend, because we're not actually going to the movies, we decided we would just take a look at a couple of movies that we can, uh, we can order on pay-per-view. So we paid for a movie that stars Nicolas Cage. It's called Rage. It was actually a fairly good movie. It was fairly well acted. It had a great story. But when the movie is over, ultimately, what did we see? We spent two hours immersed in a culture of ugliness. I didn't feel refreshed by that movie. We saw another movie also recently came out on pay-per-view. It also starred Nicolas Cage. It's called Joe. And again, that movie's a tragedy at the end of it. Another culture of ugliness. And you know what? If it's not ugly and therefore doesn't refresh you, doesn't inspire you, doesn't illuminate you, doesn't do anything for you, then you know what it is? It's predictable and politically correct. So that's what Hollywood produces nowadays. Two things. Either it's ugly or it's politically correct. So what's happening? Lots of people are simply watching TV. Now, it used to be the other way around where movies were a greater form of entertainment than staying home and watching TV. But you know what? Believe it or not, TV nowadays, you can find Shows on there that are actually more entertaining, more refreshing, more inspiring than going to the movies. There's some good things to watch on TV, believe it or not. I'll give you an example. I've recently been watching The Last Comic Standing. I think it's great. You have comedians who are competing. They're making jokes. You're actually laughing a lot of the times. You choose your favorite. You're rooting for your favorite. You're seeing a competition. And what you're seeing is very good judging by comedians that are well-known in their field. It's a lot of fun. And at the end of an episode of The Last Comic Standing, not only have I laughed quite a lot, I'm in a good mood. I haven't seen the culture of ugly. I've seen fun and funny. And you know what? I've also had an experience with fellow comedians who are talking about our daily foibles. And I, oh yeah, I can relate to that. I can relate to that. That is an example. Another one is something like America's Got Talent, where you see genuinely talented people competing, and you can be inspired by their excellence, an excellent singer, an excellent dancer. That's inspiring. That's uplifting. That's entertaining. That's refreshing. Why does Hollywood not understand what it is in the business of doing, which is to entertain people? Isn't it crystal clear that so many of us are exhausted by our work, our children, our families, our problems? When we go to the movies, when we sit in front of the television, we want to forget our problems, we want to laugh, and we want to get up feeling happy. So stimulate me. Don't give me the culture of ugly. Don't bore me with political correctness. Give me brilliance. Give me beauty. This is Dr. Grace upholding values that never die. Well, if you ask me where I come from, here's what I tell everyone. 
born by God's dear grace in an extraordinary place. This is American Heartland with Dr. Grace.